would be really useful for us to hear the, the feedback. Are we just uh, adding model on top of model, one error <laughs> on top of another error? I'm sure many of you may feel that way. Um, or are we actually providing new insight for policymakers? Is getting to those PDFs on growth for Mozambique going to be something which can be used for, for policy making? Um, is it a step forward? So uh, following tradition, maybe we start on the left and we move to the right. There's a question right at the very back, and then we'll come to the front here. Josh Busby, University of Texas. My, my question, uh, I guess, was for any of you about the probability distributions. Are they based on multiple model runs? Is that how you're able to generate those? And then the other uh, question was to elaborate a little bit more on return frequencies with respect to either drought or floods, what, what, that, that, what that means. Thanks. Right in the front, Jose. Thank you for an interesting presentation. I just try to complicate more the model now, another layer. Because, for example, a country like Mozambique, you think you need to give tool for policymakers. For example, suppose the government of Mozambique look at this, okay, what kind of decisions I have to make uh, having this information. Uh, and one issue is like countries like Mozambique, uh, they are kind of climate takers. They, they don't influence much the uncertainties, you know, and, and kind of, uh, uh, and also the levels of policy that to come. And there is huge, for these people, huge policy uncertainty. They don't know what's the probability they will be level one, level two, level three, level five, and even the business usual. And for them, you know, much of what they present is interesting, but they don't know what's the best way to do it. And if, for example, suppose they choose, okay, level one would be the most likely, and they invest a lot of money in kind of very complicated, then they cost three times more, and they'll be locked in, in actually is going to be business usual. And how you bring in this kind of uh, uncertainties uh, to the model that actually be, I think, more useful for, for policymakers. Just behind you. Uh, thank you, this is uh, Sudhakar Yedlov from India. Uh, you, uh, you have taken uh, most, mostly the sectoral approach uh, in assessing the impacts as such, especially the CGE modeling uh, I'm talking about. There could be migration uh, coming out as a result of uh, sea level rise, or there could be migration coming out of um, uh, uh, impact on agriculture. And that certainly can have a large impact on the economic uh, performance of the country. I wonder why that in interaction between sectors uh, is ignored in assessing the, the overall impact on the globe, I mean, the economic performance or value added uh, thing to the, to the national economy. The second thing is, uh, there could be some positives coming out of, say for example, impact in agriculture. There could be changing agriculture pattern may end up having a crop which is more, real, more uh, economically viable, say biodiesel uh, plantation for example. Any such possibility could be adding to the economy rather than adding negatively to the economy. Uh, did you uh, try those things uh, in your model, please? And one more question. Uh, sorry, Clemens, the person behind you. We'll come back to you in a sec. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, my name is Raba Hareski, IMF. I, uh, I realized that uh, you know, you do scenarios without a, you know, unchanged, with unchanged policy, but I wonder whether in your model there's any uh, private sector reaction. And, and the reason why I say that is, I mentioned earlier this morning that, of course, one of the big, uh, uh, you know, development these days is these large uh, land acquisitions or the consolidation of, uh, uh, of land for the purpose of potentially moder using more modern agriculture. So. I wonder uh, here if, you know, in anticipation for higher food prices, higher commodity prices, the private sector may not uh, force the modernization of agriculture and, and in a way mitigate it, but I'm, here I'm really separating the mitigation from the public sector rather than the anticipation that uh, uh, the private sector may, uh, uh, may, may uh, the way the private sector may react may indeed lead to some sort of uh, 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 positive uh, spillover out of the risk generated from the uh, uh, climate change. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll turn back to our panel. We have six questions now, and I'm going to have a, an attempt to try and allocate the questions, maybe to make it more efficient, but, um, but feel free to 
to chip in on others. Adam, maybe there was a question from, from Joshua on um, HFD and, and model runs, m multiple model runs, and then also a question on um, uh, uh, global policy uncertainty, which I think is an extremely good, good, good question. That's yeah. an uncertainty we haven't got rid of in the analysis. And then turning to Ken, a question of, again from Joshua about return periods and, and flooding and also on agricultural zones and how they may shift and to what extent um, uh, we're capturing that in the analysis. And then finally, um, Channing on migration, uh, question from the front, and also on the role of the private sector in the analysis. Adam. Okay, uh, so the first question about how, I guess really essentially how these ensembles would generate, it's actually, I'm really glad that was raised because I really didn't have time to sort of really get into the details. So. Essentially what happens is we, we take the, the economics model and the earth system model and run them linked, okay? They are linked by this emissions, by the emissions coming from the, from the economic model. And the idea, again, is going back to those, those the, the one slide where I showed the sort of the parameter space, if you will, of certain aspects of the climate system that we feel are uncertain. All right, so one of them is climate sensitivity. We have a range of climate sensitivity um, based on work um, that I showed. And we use a Latin hypercube sample of that parameter space. And so essentially when you do that, you can, you can make your bins really small and your resulting ensemble size can be on the order of 10,000. So if you take each one of those uncertain pieces of the puzzle, choose your bin and do a Latin hypercube, which basically means you're separating these distributions under equal probabilities and run them all, you get a very large ensemble. We've done approaches similar to what Channing mentioned, the, the, the Gaussian quadrature, and we found that when we run about 400 through this Latin hypercube sample, um, we can span the range of parametric uncertainty in our model. So it's not Again, this is not particularly a model. It's a model framework. It's a framework that's trying to capture the uncertainty or the structural uncertainties, the parametric uncertainties that we see in climate models. So yes, it is one model, but it's, the approach is, is done deliberately to try to span the range of the structural uncertainties that we see in climate models. Hopefully that, that addressed that question. The next one was about the, yeah, so, wow. So I agree with you that fundamentally what we do um, with policy is, is, is very exogenous. And what do I mean by that? Is that we are predetermining what the policy future is. And we have no way of, of, of really letting that be dynamic. In other words, we march along and we say, well, wait a minute, that didn't work. So let's stop what we're doing and do something else or try a different tact. Um, I guess probably the, the, the best way to answer your question or address your question is that I would say holistically, if you could take this approach and run it across a range of policies that you deem are plausible, realistic, could happen, maybe not happen, um, you might get a sense of what the policy uncertainty is. But the problem is, is you're just, you're just adding you know, distribution upon distribution and you may end up with something that's completely white noise. You know, there's really no, there's nothing to glean from it other than anything is possible in the future. So I think at least in terms of trying to, to understand what we see in the model and what we can interpret from the model, the approach of looking at these stabilization scenarios is again resonates with the IPCC community which is we need to avoid this much warming or this much accumulation of trace gases in the, in the environment. Those are the sorts of approaches that we've taken. We have used the model to look at things like biofuel policy. What if we embrace some penetration of biofuel into the, in, into the energy sector? What does that mean for land use change and the dynamics of land use change between what we need to plant to feed ourselves and what we need to plant to generate as much bioenergy as, as we think we need? So. Our approach is, is, is certainly fluid in that sense. We can adapt to different policy scenarios, but we certainly do have to pick a path before we, before we put this model ahead. But it's a, it's, an, it's a very important issue that you raise. Um, to, to add on to what Adam was saying about the um, policy uncertainty, um, one of the things it does is 
it allows the, um, the countries themselves to look at how vulnerable they are, in particular in terms of if we're just looking at reservoir design and we see that under, over all the ranges of them, you still have a significant negative um, probability or, or frequency of, of events. The, the country can make their choice of how to hedge that bet themselves in terms of design. And one of the big things it's leading to is, since we don't know where we're going, is this whole idea that's coming out in the world of infrastructure of flexible design. And we may be, instead of overbuilding and have a regret of overbuilding or underbuilding without room for, for uh, adaptation or adding to it, is make, spending a little bit more now um, to be able to add on. So an example would be, we see it in many places, if it's a foundation, we make the foundation big enough to handle another, another 20 or 30 feet of meters of dam on top if, it, if we do get this extra water. Or it's very cheap to, to leave a hole for another turbine, but it's very expensive to put the turbine in if it won't be used for 50 years or maybe it's never going to be used. The other thing I think it happens is it helps the, um, one of the things we've got feedback from is people involved in the climate debate and the mitigation debate to see how their country is faring under different policies. So if they, if they can see that this policy, they're a climate taker, that they're going to benefit from these policies going on, or if they're not. So it allows them to see the, those possibilities and use it on the mitigation as well as the impacts and adaptation side. So that's something that happens there. Um, in terms of the return periods, um, there is a, um, a nice thing that has happened with this work is that there is a standard for design in structures, in water resources and in roads. An example is that generally for roads, depending on the type of road, you'll have something which you'll call the, the one in 10 year return period, which is probability of 10% every year that your, your structure would fail. And we designed to that. In the OECD countries, we use one in 50. For, for flooding, we use one in 100 in certain um, high important, high valued areas. Um, what we're finding in developing countries is they may have these standards in handbooks on the shelves, but they're not being implemented. So basically, developing countries are underinsuring their infrastructure. But we understand why is because of the cap lack of capital. Or what, what we see happening is instead of building um, 200 kilometers of road in a five-year uh, a five-year plan, um, they'll want to build four 4,000 kilometers in that period to a lesser standard. But what happens is we're finding that it's the damage is so. As we look at these return periods, we're seeing that there is not enough protection to current climate variability. And the best way to adapt to the future climate changes is just to adapt to the current variability you're doing, and at and as you look forward, we're finding out in certain cases, it's only a marginal cost to go a little bit higher, as Channing pointed out. In a study in La Ceiba in Honduras, to make the one in 20 year storm event for, the, for putting in the entire drainage system for the town of La Ceiba, it was 5% more than doing the one in 10 year storm. So you're getting 20%, 100% increase in protection now, and the projection is by 2050, the one in 20 will become the one in 10. So we have to look at these things in sectoral areas as we do it, and working with the ministries of planning and the ministries of water resources or transport to look at how we deal with these, these climate issues. So that's kind of how we, we look at those. And then um, in terms of um, spatial areas, um, the models are looking at, at the spatial areas, and we model the impacts on all crops so that if, the, if in the model there is an advantage or certain crops are losing their advantage or gaining them, those are in the model for the economics to choose them with the autonomous adaptation. So that information or those response curves, the change in the, the, change in the production functions, those are in there in the models making those choices as they face them in the future. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try to finish off uh, quickly. Uh, in terms of migration, it, it, labor is moving all around within the country. It's not, we, we don't have an endogenous, they're not going to South Africa more uh, uh, and, and, and remitting back. Um, and that's just, you know, a choice that, that we've done. But, but labor is definitely 
urbanizing throughout the whole period, uh, it would move out of, of areas that are not doing as well and into areas that, that are doing as well. And that gets to sort of the private sector reaction. The, the private sector is, is reacting uh, looking at what, what's happening to the return to investments across a, a whole slew of sectors, right? And so uh, if certain sectors are, are doing well, then, then investment's going to go in that direction. Uh, and an important thing to point out is, you know, the model has uh, a productivity or, or whatever your impacts are getting are, are as one determinant of investment. The price is, is another, right? Uh, and, and so uh, it can be the case that uh, climate change is driving down the productivity of a certain sector, but it's driving up its price even more. So instead of investing away from a highly affected sector, you're investing into the highly affected sector, and, and, and that does happen uh, uh, within, within the model. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Clemens, we promised you a question, and then we're going to have to go over to the right, and we'll try and come back if we have time, but I'm not sure if we do. Um, Clemens in the middle. I'm Clemens from IFPRI. Adam, I really like your representation of the wheel. I was really tempted to start spinning the wheel and see what, what's coming out of there. Now, my question um, to Channing, first of all, is how would uh, such a wheel look like for Mozambique? Could we represent our choices in terms of the wheel? That's the first question. And the second question, if we, if we put that wheel in front of a policy maker, would he not say, well, do you know how many wheels I have to spin all the time? So, and since this is a, a, a conference on climate change and development policy, can we create one wheel for the policymaker? I, I'll just give you an example if that is too abstract. The policymaker may say, um, you know, what happens if I don't invest in education, then my education level is going down. If I don't invest in health, then you know my child mortality will, will, will go up. And, and so on, there, there, may be, there may be broader choices to make. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Clement. Over to the right a person in the very back on the right. And then we'll come to you in the front and to you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Anthony Milner from the London School of Economics. Um, I just have a question about your sort of modeling strategy. Um, so uh, it's obviously an extremely complex model. And um, as we know, uh, models with very high dimensional parameter spaces very often um, are subject to overfitting um, and uh, may in fact do less well than uh, much simpler models of predicting aggregate uh, variables. Um, so I just wondered, now given the climate problem and the fact that you're sort of dealing with a problem that we haven't seen yet, whether you have any thoughts about um, the possibility of using past data to validate your model in some kind of out of sample test, or at least components of the model. If any comments on that would be very welcome, thanks. Right, uh, the gentleman here on the left hand side. Sorry, Ants, I'm making. Oh, let, 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 let's, we'll come back to you in a second. The woman here with her hand up. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks for your presentation. I have two questions about the model. First, uh, uh, could you please uh, introduce more about the regional response to the global climate change? Uh, especially how you model this. Is this a C, um, GCM model? If, the, uh, if it is, uh, can we uh, access to your model? And second is for the CGE model. Uh, how, man, how many uh, sectors and the regions do you uh, consider in this model? Uh, and also, uh, is your CGE model published? Can we uh, read some papers um, about your model? Thank you. Very good. Um, sorry, we sit just here in the middle, and then we'll come to you. Thanks. My name is uh, Jagede Adimola. I'm from the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. Now, my, my question is simple. You know, I can see somebody on that slide. I don't know whether it's a he or a she. You know, I can see some firewood on her head. Then the question that comes to my mind is, how, how do we make this model you know, meaningful to look at populations who, are, who bear the brunt of, of this development that we talk about? You know, is it just elitist model or is it a model down to heart? We're talking about biofuels, we're talking about uh, you know, hydroelectric uh, projects, 
all these projects negatively impact you know people particularly in africa you know it promotes and you know it promotes land grabbing which is a phenomenon which is rampant in ethiopia uganda where all these projects have been implemented now if we if you're factioning a model I, I want us to humanize this model. Let, let, let's, let's put humanity on its face. Let's put the feeling of these local populations you know, on it. Let's, let's put their image to it. And let it make sense to them. And I think, I don't know whether it's a comment or a question. Right. Okay. It's the first time our models have been called elitist, okay? <laughs> elitist in our ivory tower. It's a good US political issue. Um, here in the front. Thanks. Just behind you. My name is Nidhi, I'm from Leibniz University, Germany. I have two points. First point for the first speaker about the model. See, uh, generally it's uh, been noticed and argued that the global models don't perform well in tropical systems. And as your area of interest is the tropical uh, region, so what was your observation? And do you think that CMIP 5, which is the update on CMIP 3, will have more possibilities and potential to pro project better in tropical uh, conditions? Point number two is about, we've heard perspectives on biophysical climate, climate and economic analysis, but uh, often in discussions, issues on livelihoods, poverty, gender remains under or unaddressed in uh, getting a holistic approach towards development policy. So inviting your thought on that. I think what we'll do, we've got again six questions and so we'll, we'll put them back to the panel. We have uh, Clemens's question about the wheels and how many wheels can we spin at the same time or how many wheels can we give to policymakers to capture the trade-offs. Um, we have a question on historical validation of the models and, and on the building strategy. Um, uh, Channing, maybe you handle the, the multiple wheels. The first question, um, Ken, if you talk about maybe historical validation, although I'm sure everybody uh, wants to chip in on that. Um, there's the regional response question um, and how that's factored into the IGSM. So Adam, maybe you can tackle that one. Um, uh, the elitist model question, which, um, which I think the question boils down to, to what extent are we capturing the human dimension in this analysis um, in, in uh, what is already a, a super model framework? Um, ca can we go one step further? Um, I, again, I'll leave that, that for all three uh, panelists to, to comment on. Um, a question on, on uh, how effective is the model in capturing tropical uh, climates, and that's definitely for Adam. And then finally on, and again it's somewhat, I guess, related to the human dimension, which is to what extent can we incorporate gender and poverty considerations in models that project out to, to, to 2015. So, Adam, do you want to have a, a crack to begin with, or should we start with Channing? Okay, let's start with Channing. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, on multiple wheels, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with Adam that, that you know, he, he made the point once, once you start to do too many wheels, then, then things can go awry. Uh, we could easily build a wheel, uh, just like they've done. We could take, you know, okay, what, what GDP do, do you want? And, and look to divide up the, the PDFs that we had and, uh, and, and stick them on, on wheels. And we would have two wheels, just like the climate wheel, and it would be the GDP wheel, right? So uh, you, would, you, get, uh, you spin and you get this wheel, or you, you spin and, and you get another, and, and the L1, the level one stabilization wheel, you know, has a lot more favorable outcomes and, and a lot less um, dispersion um, in it. That, that, would be, um, that would be possible. I think, you know, one of the things that came to mind as you were asking the question is, is to, you know, what we're coming up with with the scope of impact um, by 2050. You know, in the very worst case, we had 10%, uh, uh, right, around there. And remember, the baseline growth rate is, is five. So in the worst case, we're two years delayed, right? By 2052, we're going to be at where we, where we would have been, OK? That, that's the, so it's something. Uh, and, and they're losing it every year. So when you present value it, it's, it's, it's there. Um, but but there, the, this, is, this is the level of impact um, uh, that, that we're getting. Now, that's out to 2050. And I think this speaks to, I think one of the panelists this morning was saying, oh, there's a, there's a difference between what the economists say and what the, the social scientists is, or the, the climate scientists are saying. And that, I think part of the reason is that the climate scientist is talking about you know, 2090 or 2100, and, uh, and we're talking about 2050, right? Uh, if, if you get, uh, if we get seven degrees of centigrade of warming 
uh, by 2090, I mean, my imagination is not that fertile to, to, to model that. I, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's so far beyond anything that we've seen that, you know, I, it's, I, we've just, I haven't gone there. Uh, so I think the, the, that time dimension is really important um, uh, to remember. On, on, on overfitting, this is a, uh, let me, uh, I'll take that one. Uh, the, these are structural models, so we're not, we're not estimating them. We, we take them out, you know, and, and, and we're following in a, in a structure, and this allows us various policy parameters. I wasn't, oh, was I assigned the validation question? No, that was me. But okay, you, go, you go ahead, and then I'll, then I'll chip in. So I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, to, to, to tag team here and take the baton, um, in the biophysics, we are using um, the standard water resource and agricultural engineering tools that are the state of the art for doing design now by um, engineering firms that go in and use them. And so the first principles of those is we validate them with historic conditions. So all of our work is validated to historic conditions and there's a whole way to do that. And then we move forward with the climate driving them. There is um, the, the risk that some models of hydrology or, or others the, the change of climate, and this has again is towards the end of the century, can be so far out of what we've ever seen that how valid are our models? That's a, a risk that we take, but generally by 2050 we are not seeing things much different than some of the extreme values we've seen in the past. So we feel pretty confident that these models are representative of, of, what's, of what's, going, what's going on. And on, on the other scale is there, there is the ability to bring into some of these models, depending on the scale, human aspects. And one of those particularly is flooding, because those who are hurt the most about flooding are the poor. And so when we, we do things with flood mapping and showing that the, where you're getting flooded are generally where the poor are, and why they may not show up in the GDP, they show up as numbers of people affected. So we try to work on that as best we can and as you can see, in some of this work, as we're looking to economic development policy, we're aggregating up, but you can go in, in the other direction, and these models can assist in that as well. It's all on, on the question being asked, but it's an appropriate question, and that's why um, human health and some of these things are, are being poured, brought in and have been used. And uh, some of the work that Adams showed um, has been used for looking at, at um, health impacts of some of these um, uh, impacts as well. Adam, on the regional response and tropical validation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to actually, my response will sort of touch on both of the questions, which I think were very poignant and related and, and really get at the heart of essentially what we're trying to do here, which is, I would say in a generic sense, you could, you know, lift the hood on any model and find a whole can of worms. Um, it struck me that you sort of pointed to the tropics because um, I have a number of colleagues who feel like the tropics are our best hope for climate models, that you can actually get um, a signal out of the noise, if you will, the intrinsic model noise from climate models that actually can, can indicate some, some form of impact that we can really rally around and say, yes, all of our models are consistent with this signal and it's coming out of the tropics and people in the tropics are not used to a lot of variability in climate to begin with. And if you see this signal come out of the noise, then this is something that we really need to point to. It's, so I find it very striking that you feel as though that's a weakness of the models, and yet there's another big chunk of the community, the community that says this is, this is a great opportunity. So I think that falls under the general categories of, as I said before, you know, there's no perfect model. And I, I think we all wish that we could we could hang our hats on that one model and say this is the one that we're going to go with but I'd like to think that our approach holistically uh, tries to encapsulate all of these 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 picadillos if you will <laughs> that are in models um, and as you pointed out there is another round of the CMIP um, of the CMIP exercises that's out we certainly didn't 
mean to be disrespectful of CMIP5 in our study. It's just that this study happened a few years ago and the CMIP3 data was what was, was available to us, but certainly we are looking to the CMIP5 models along these lines. I will say though that some of the initial findings of CMIP5 against CMIP3 show that for the most part the climate models don't show a big difference in I'll generally describe their skill. We don't, we don't really see a, a, a real salient change in, in the way that these climate models are operating. I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad or a good thing because these models are far more complicated than they used to be. So there's a lot more information that we can take from them. But in a generic sense with the climate variables that we're comfortable with and we've, we have a lot of experience with, we don't see any real difference um, in their skill so far. Um, with regard to the regional information that we've, that we've garnered from, from these runs, the, the regional details of the model are, you could say, sort of a, a, an algorithmic extension of these more sophisticated climate models. We don't actually run, well, in our framework we can run a climate model, but to get these thousands of different realizations, we have to use sort of an algorithmic approach, this Taylor expansion, all right? And all it basically says is that we find, we try to find some emergent behavior on a regional sense from these climate models and we put it in in terms of, sort of in sort of an, in this Taylor expansion form. All right, so there's not really a model running per se, but we're trying to, to discern some emergent behavior or, or response from the model. In terms of its availability, we're, we're sort of a research institute right now. We have, we have the global model results available. Um, in terms of these regional results, yes, the data can be provided um, gladly um, to those who are interested. Uh, for other regions, it's, it's sort of a, well, if, if this is our new focus, then we will generate the data for, 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 that, um, for that region. The, the issue here really is, is, and as much as I hate to admit it, it's, it's just sort of storage capacity. Um, you know, we generate terabytes of data um, to provide for these simulations, and it's, it's hard to sort of keep that metadata available at any one given time. So um, for those of you who are interested in the information that we've used, the climate information that we've used for this study, I think that's something that we can arrange. Okay, well thank you very much. We, we've reached the end of the day uh, so, and we can certainly say thank you very much to the, to the panel. Okay.